you are about to know the thrill of seeing that which has never been seen before. You are about to enter a beautiful, exciting, wonderful new world, the world of 1960. For the first time in history, you'll see not one, not two, but three completely new kinds of Ford cars for 1960. A wonderful new world of Fords. Ever since Henry Ford started tinkering with engines and jumped into the lead of the nascent automobile industry at the end of the 19th century, America has been a major producer of motor vehicles. Sometimes the styling wasn't too subtle and the cars themselves were seldom small, but America took to the motor car more than any other nation, building impressive roads to cater for the vast numbers of machines which rolled off the assembly lines. The US embraced the motor car like a wheeled god, got behind the wheel, and soon it seemed that no one walked anywhere anymore. Personal mobility meant that people could be anywhere they wanted to be in just a few minutes, so they moved further away, and towns became sprawling conurbations across hundreds of square miles, and journeys became longer and longer. Vast tracts of land were given over to places to merely park cars, and more still to roads that linked all the places Americans would want to go. The country that gave us the shopping mall also gave us the parking lot and drive through convenience. A whole new culture emerged, centered around the motor vehicle, and it seemed that just about anything could be done in a car, even dining out. Or going to the movies. Drive-in theaters became a major feature of American life, a rite of passage for newly independent teenage drivers and their dates. As the United States highway system began to develop in the 1920s, long-distance road journeys became more common and the need for inexpensive overnight accommodation close to the main roads led to the growth of the motel, literally the motorist's hotel. About the time that Henry Ford was building his first cars, so too was Ransom Olds. Early cars looked like, and really were, horse-drawn carriages without the horse. General Motors bought Oldsmobile in 1908, and during its 107-year history, the company produced 35 million cars. When it was killed off by GM, Oldsmobile was the oldest surviving American automobile mark, and one of the oldest in the world after Daimler and Peugeot. But it is Henry Ford that the world knows as the father of US motoring. In his older years, he'd get out a reproduction of his first car, the quadricycle, and drive his wife Clara around their estate, Fair Lane. Ford's impact was felt not just in creating motor cars, but in economics, production, management and engineering. He worked out that the more cars he built, the cheaper he could sell each one, and thus was born the economy of scale. The price of Ford's Model T dropped every year as more and more were built. By 1918, half of all the cars in America were Model Ts. Henry Ford was a pioneer of welfare capitalism. He needed to reduce a high turnover of workers, and efficiency meant hiring and keeping the best people. So, Ford announced a $5 per day program in 1914, more than doubling the minimum daily pay for qualifying workers. Ford claimed that with this voluntary change, labor turnover in his plants went from huge to so small that he simply stopped bothering to measure it. 
when Ford started paying $5 a day and also a 40-hour working week, he was criticized by other industrialists and by Wall Street. But he proved that paying people more would enable Ford workers to afford the cars they were producing, and it was good for the economy. By bringing the parts together on a moving assembly line and by simplifying the work so that he didn't need to find skilled craftsmen, Ford was able to build hundreds of cars a day. The production line and mass production soon became common expressions and their influence would forever change almost every industry on Earth. A Sunday afternoon drive with the family became a national pastime. For some families, it became a ritual, a habit. It was possible to travel quite large distances to visit family and friends, even if actually getting going took quite a while. And sometimes the roads weren't too good either. The sheer volume of traffic in the early days meant that many existing roads became impassable almost as soon as it began to rain. Local, state and federal governments were forced to invest heavily in building a road network capable of handling the sudden rush of cars, a never-ending task that seems destined to last as long as cars are still being driven. Bigger vehicles just made it worse, even if they were employed in the construction process itself. The First World War was the first major conflict where petrol-powered vehicles had played a significant part. And in return, the development of vehicles such as the truck were greatly accelerated once their usefulness was apparent. Bigger and more complex road-building machines were designed that did the work of 10 or even 100 men. Hard surface roads were developed roads that wouldn't get chopped up into muddy quagmires in the rain and wouldn't become rock hard and dusty in the heat of summer. Various systems have been developed over centuries to reduce washaways, bogging and dust in cities, including cobblestones and even wooden paving. Tar-bound macadam was applied to roads towards the end of the 19th century in cities like Paris. Tarmac was patented by Edgar Purnell Hooley in 1901 and is a mix of tar and aggregate like granite chips, compacted with a road roller. Adding small amounts of Portland cement, resin and pitch modified the tar. Other roads were made with concrete, but as speeds rose, some surfaces offered better grip when wet or dry than others, while extremes of temperatures made some melt or crack. As oil production increased, a byproduct called asphalt became available in quantity and replaced tar thanks to its reduced sensitivity to temperature. Roads joined villages, towns and cities in all directions right across America. The motor car, and specifically the Model T Ford, wasn't only about personal mobility. It brought home the shopping, carried the doctor on house calls, and a whole new industry of mechanics, services, garages, petrol and oil supplies grew up to provide the vital provisions needed by the car. For the first time, Americans were able to travel more than a few miles from home inexpensively. They were able to roam and explore their own country in their own cars. They were able to visit the great national parks, set aside for the people, but which few people have been able to reach or explore. The weekend getaway, shooting, fishing and hunting, or just a day trip into the countryside with the family became not just a possibility, but a reality and the vehicle used for these idyllic moments was, inevitably, a Model T Ford. People made jokes about them, but in the 19 years it was in production, over 15 million tin lizzies were built, a record it would take the Volkswagen Beetle 27 years to beat, 45 years later. Another famous American brand name to see three centuries is Buick, who built a closed car years before Ford. Buick was the mainstay of what would become General Motors. Despite its history and technical superiority of a century ago, Buick was nearly killed off in the disastrous first decade of the 21st century. But of course the motor car has had a pivotal role from the very start in that other favourite of the American public, 
the motion picture. In 1927, the Model T had reached the end of its development and more sophisticated cars were needed. So Henry Ford himself commissioned the very first of the new Model A. Unlike the Model T, which was only available in black, the Model A was sold in four colors, but not black. And although it was only in production for a little over four years, nearly five million Model As were built. Ford wasn't only a visionary engineer and a businessman, he also had a keen eye for a promotion, and over the years, he made a point of marking his company's milestones, invariably with a replica quadricycle on hand too. Sadly, the original quadricycle, the very first Ford, had to be sold to finance what came later, and it was lost in the roadworks of history. But it was this car, the Ford Model 18, but usually called simply the Ford V8, which would come to define American motoring. Variations on the eight-cylinder engine would become almost universal across the US motor industry. The big rumbling engines would become the basis for generations of cars, millions of vehicles, and a national obsession with what would become known as muscle cars. Mr. Ford was on hand as the one millionth and three millionth V8 rolled out the factory door. LaSalle was a very different automobile brand. It wasn't built from scratch by a visionary engineer, but was created to fill a gap in the market by General Motors CEO Alfred P. Sloan. A LaSalle could handle rough road, but was intended to be a luxurious car. Sloan put the company's nameplates into price order. Chevrolet was the entry-level brand, and next came Oakland, Oldsmobile, Buick, and Cadillac. Cadillac prices soared in the 1920s, and the LaSalle was intended to fill the gap that existed between it and Buick. A mediocre seller, the name vanished just 13 years later. Similarly, Ford produced the Lincoln as an upmarket brand for wealthy people who wouldn't be seen in anything as common as a Ford. This was luxury, for the passengers at least, for by now professional drivers, chauffeurs, could be hired to deal with the increasingly heavy traffic, but often they worked in a small, cramped and spartan cabin, while their passengers enjoyed every luxurious feature of the age. Soon, Ford's dream of a car in every driveway in every town and city was coming true. This advert goes even further than that. This is a great day for me, having my daughter graduate an honor student. Oh, Daddy. <laughs> oh, Ellen, just a moment. Look over here. Well, how do you like it? You don't mean, Daddy, that it's really mine. It's all yours, and here are the keys. Oh, Daddy. <laughs> Come on, girls, let's go for a ride. Here, Mother. Oh, a new Ford. And what a lovely color. And such a roomy seat. And now, Ellen, you also have the key to style leadership. Get the feel of V8 performance. See your nearest Ford dealer for a ride in the quality car in the low price field. Not to be outdone. GM's creative marketing people were busy too. It appears that everybody's ready. And into the spacious luggage compartment with the bags. Careful, that's Grandma's present. 
Get in, Rex, you're going too. And their 1940 Chevrolet will get them to their destination easily, safely, and with the utmost economy. Solid comfort. And that also describes Chevrolet for 1940. With its bigger and roomier body by Fisher and perfected knee action riding system, the Ride Royal, one of Chevrolet's 175 important modern features, reasons why Chevrolet's first again. That same year, 1940, while much of the rest of the world was in the grips of the Second World War, America was celebrating its take on the World Fair at Flushing Meadows in New York. It was the first exposition to be based on the future, with an opening slogan of Dawn of a New Day, and it allowed over 44 million visitors to take a look at the world of tomorrow. Not surprisingly, transport was a big part of both what the fair was and did. It covered five square kilometers, and new vehicles were both a big drawcard for visitors and a headache for organizers. The Ford building, covering nearly 30,000 square meters, was just one of the places where the US motor industry was showcased. Inside, visitors were exposed to the evolution of the car from its infancy to the then present day. At the time, less than four decades in Ford's case. The main entrance hall is a symphony in color and a fascinating introduction to what follows. Here is a panorama of the motor car age starting with the first Ford car, built in 1903, and coming down to the present Ford, the Lux Ford, Mercury, Lincoln Zephyr and Lincoln, style leaders for the road of tomorrow. And the centerpiece was Ford's the cycle of production, a 30-meter turntable weighing over 150 tons and floating in over 70,000 liters of water. It used animated models to reveal how the car industry spreads employment across many sectors of society and into areas far removed from the actual car making factories. The automobile industry spreads employment back through its suppliers, back to the raw material. Once out of the exhibition hall, visitors were invited to ride on what was dubbed the Road of Tomorrow. We would call them flyovers and take them for granted. General Motors was a conglomeration of car brands. Started in 1908, it would become the world's largest corporation and was the highest selling car maker in the world for 77 consecutive years, from 1931 to 2008, when it lost this epithet to Toyota. Through the years, GM has produced cars called Cadillac, Elmore, Oakland, Buick, Chevrolet, Daiyu, GMC, Holden, Hummer, Oldsmobile, Opel, Pontiac, Saab, Saturn, and Vauxhall. At its peak, General Motors employed 350,000 people and operated 150 factories on six continents. The 1940 Hydromatic Oldsmobile saw another momentous step in the evolution of the automobile. It was the first mass production car fitted with an automatic gearbox. Cadillac began working on a shiftless transmission in 1932, but Oldsmobile introduced the Hydromatic because it produced more cars than Cadillac at the time, and to protect Cadillac's reputation if the market rejected the new transmission. Once the US had committed to the Second World War, Many industries were switched to manufacturing not just weapons, but the planes, trucks and ships needed by our modern fighting force. The US built over 150,000 battle tanks, a quarter of a million cannons, over two and a half million machine guns, and two and a quarter million military trucks. The war, just as in the First World War, prompted engineering advances at a much greater rate than in peacetime. Also, developments in mass production that came directly from the motor industry were applied to the munitions factories, and much of industrialized America became a war machine making war machines. The US also built over 300,000 military aircraft, and Henry Ford's magic was at work here too. The B-24 Liberator heavy bomber was the most produced American aircraft in history, with over 18,000 built. Ford opened Willow Run, the world's largest factory outside the USSR, in August 1942. There, on the biggest assembly line in the world, 428 B-24s a month were built. 
the Army asked 135 companies for working prototypes of a four-wheel drive reconnaissance car, setting a deadline of just 49 days. Working without pay, freelance designer Carl Probst drew up plans for the Bantam prototype in two days, estimated the total cost of the vehicle, and submitted a bid in five days, complete with blueprints. The Army chose Overland Willys, with Ford as the second supplier, to build what became known as the Jeep. After the war, thousands of Army surplus vehicles were spread all over the world, and on weekends, groups of US Jeep fans took their hardy little vehicles out into the wilderness. These weekend warriors became rampaging ridge runners, keen to put their Jeeps and themselves to the test in some pretty tough terrain. With none of the safety gear of today's cars, the hardy passengers risked being flicked out, not only from their seats, but right out of the vehicles. And when things got hot, a cooling off period didn't mean a seat on the sidelines, but a seat in the middle of the action. Wet or muddy, it didn't matter. With a posse on Jeep back skidding off to the old cry, they went that away. Post war reconstruction was harsh, but by the 1950s, people were looking to a bright new future, and the car industry responded in kind. New factories and new workers churned out new cars that just seemed to get bigger and bigger. About this time, American cars became irrelevant to the rest of the world, and vice versa. They were too big for many European cities and roads, and their styling was too brash for countries still recovering from the debilitating effects of World War II. In Detroit, no one seemed to care. They were hard at work fulfilling local demand. In the 1950s, the area had the highest median income and the highest rate of home ownership of any major US city. Four out of every five cars in the world was made in the US, half of them by GM. No other car companies had the capital or the know-how to enter the global car business. GM's main US rival, Ford, was half its size. The largest foreign car maker, Volkswagen, was little bigger than GM's own German subsidiary, Opel, and only had one model, the Beetle. And Toyota wasn't even on the horizon. It made 23,000 cars in 1955 in Japan, compared to 4 million manufactured by GM in the US. But the volumes of cars being built and sold meant that despite millions spent on upgrading the roads, traffic jams started slowing down average speeds for routine journeys. America's solution was ever more, ever bigger roads, cutting across the countryside like fat black snakes, linking homes and offices, schools, shops and factories. Divided roads with four or more lanes in each direction, once considered more than sufficient, encouraged more travelers, and within a handful of years would become clogged to a virtual standstill. Big new roads did mean that people in outlying areas could more easily travel to find work. Rural dwellers could now work in industry as well as on the land their forefathers had farmed. Farmers, once isolated from their markets, could now drive there easily, saving valuable daylight hours. Better transport meant schoolchildren could attend schools further away from home than their parents and grandparents did. Rural, one-room schoolhouses and single teachers were replaced by big, modern schools with teams of specialist teachers. This meant greater challenges for growing minds and the teachers, but better resources too. Out-of-town residents also found that owning a car meant being able to get to another American invention that probably wouldn't have happened without the motor car, the shopping mall. With lots of retail outlets all in one convenient place and with convenient access and parking right outside, a whole new method of shopping evolved and spelled the death knell for older retail outlets. Away from the rush of changes bought and wrought by the automobile, an annual car show was staged by General Motors. From 1949 to 1961, Motorama tried to boost sales with displays of prototypes, concept cars and other special models. Here are some of the Motorama vehicles, all of which were complete and running handmade cars that have survived over half a century to the present day. The Buick XP300 was a design exercise from 1951 and the name came from its experimental status and the 300 horsepower delivered by its supercharged V8 engine, which took the car to over 220 kilometers an hour. Looking half a century ahead of its time, the Buick ran on methanol, 
had a heat-treated aluminium body, push-button seat adjustment, electric windows and power jacks. The 1951 LeSabre showcased very advanced ideas. Made of aluminium and magnesium, it had a modern automatic gearbox, a rain-activated self-raising roof, a dual-fuel, supercharged, fuel-injected V8 engine and built-in hydraulic jacks. Rumoured to have cost as much as a million dollars, equal to ten times that today, it was used as a personal car for years by GM's head of design, Harley Earl. GM's experimental turbine engines went into a needle-nosed, fiberglass-reinforced plastic delta-winged vehicle, the Firebird 1. Four years later, in 1956, the more refined four-passenger Firebird 2 appeared, using the first regenerative gas turbine, which allowed the use of air conditioning and power steering. Firebird 3 was built in 1958. A two-passenger turbine car, it had a single joystick controller replacing the steering wheel and pedals. The Buick Centurion appeared at the 1956 Motorama. Its bodywork was made of fiberglass and its cabin was inspired by an aircraft. The bubble roof was more stylish than it was practical, but the swooping rear fins would appear on production cars three years later. A 325 horsepower V8 engine was fitted and, decades ahead of its time, a television camera reported on what was behind the car to a small TV screen and the dash. When the doors were opened, the seats slid backwards automatically to give better access to the red leather and brushed metal interior. The Buick Skylark was made in six production runs. Each design varied due to changing technology and tastes. Introduced to mark Buick's 50th anniversary, the Skylark was one of three special convertibles produced in 1953. Of the three, the Skylark had the biggest production, with 1,690 units. Design chief Harley Earl convinced GM they needed a two-seater sports car because returning soldiers were bringing home MGs, Jaguars and Alfa Romeos. With his special projects crew, Earl began Project Opal in 1951. The result was the hand-built EX122 Corvette prototype, first shown at the 1953 Motorama at the Waldorf Astoria in New York. Production began six months later with both a heater and a radio as extra cost options. The Corvette was rushed into production to capitalize on the enthusiastic public reaction to the concept car, but it was underpowered and the project was almost cancelled. The six-cylinder engine and two-speed auto gearbox won few friends. The concept car was used as a test mule for the V8 engine that was fitted in 1955. It is now in a museum in Atlantic City. In contrast, the volume-selling cars were a little more ordinary. Getting there is a real treat when you drive Chevrolet, the best-looking, best-driving car on the road. Try a handsome new, gleaming new nine-passenger Beauville. For shopping, for hauling a full load of kids to a picnic, you name it, the Beauville fills the bill. Or step into a Bel Air Sport Coupe, long, low, distinctive, truly Chevrolet in design and performance. You'll like Chevy's get up and go, as exciting to drive as it is appealing to the eye. And how easily the new Chevrolet handles, a little lady, a big station wagon, how nicely it corners on a bumpy road. Cadillac's identity as an American automotive icon was unmistakable by 1957. The cars celebrated the good life with voluptuous styling and vast chrome trims, backed up with some real engineering creativity. Reaching into the luxury stratosphere was the 1957 Cadillac Eldorado Brougham, costing $13,074. Rumoured to have cost as much as a million dollars, equal to ten times that today, 
One of the most interesting Cadillacs of the 1950s, this low-slung, pillarless sedan featured center-opening doors and a roof capped in brushed stainless steel, one of Harley Earl's favorite touches, while standard quad headlights were an industry first. The 57 Chevy was available in three models, the upscale Bel Air, the mid-range 210, and the 150 in two-door, station wagon, and convertible bodies. The car's image is often used in toys, graphics, music, movies, and television as typical of 1950s American cars. For 57, Chevrolet dictated a series of changes that increased the cost of the car. These included a new dashboard and air ducts in the headlight pods, which resulted in the distinctive chrome headlights that helped make the 57 Chevy a classic. 14-inch wheels gave the car a lower stance, and a wide grille made it look wider from the front. The famous 57 Chevy tail fins duplicated the wide look from the rear. The Chevrolet Impala became the best-selling car in the United States when big models dominated the market, competing against Ford's Galaxy 500 and the Plymouth Fury. The Impala was introduced in 1958 as a new upmarket sporty trim package created for Bel Air coupes and convertibles. Unique to the model were its six tail lights, which set it apart from cheaper models. This classic styling would become its trademark. From 1958 to 65, it was Chevrolet's most expensive passenger model. The Cadillac Eldorado was part of the Cadillac line from 1953 to 2002, the longest running American luxury car range. Eldorado models were always near the top of the Cadillac lineup and were among the most extravagantly styled vehicles of their day. The Eldorado had its own rear-end styling with high, slender, pointed tail fins. These contrasted with the thick, bulbous fins common at the time, an example of Eldorado pointing the way forward. It was a four-door hardtop with rear-hinged rear doors that cost more than the Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud of the same year. It featured air suspension, the first memory power seats, and even small bottles of perfume. The convertibles were the vehicle of choice for celebrities, movie stars, and the beautiful people of the 1950s. By 1960, the American automobile industry had consolidated into the big three, General Motors, Ford and Chrysler, and American Motors. These firms not only dominated the domestic market, they were supreme globally. In 1960, American companies built 93% of the cars sold in the United States, and 48% of world sales were by US-owned subsidiaries in countries on every inhabited continent. But imported cars, led by Volkswagen and followed by Fiat, Renault, Datsun and Hillman, began to nibble their way into the rich American market, supplying the one sort of car that America didn't build. Small ones. The growing presence of imports disturbed Detroit, and the big three responded with their own modest cars. GM produced the Corvair, Ford the Falcon, and Chrysler the Valiant. Then they ramped up production of the so-called muscle cars, powerful, sleek sports models such as the Mustang. Beautiful from any point of view, worth more from every point of value. The 1960 Fords open up a whole wonderful new world of styling elegance and built for people comfort. And now, the world's most wanted car. Thunderbird, the finest of fine cars, the last word in wish it were mine cars, the dream car of the wonderful new world of Fords. The 1960 Thunderbird. Finally, the car everyone's been waiting to see. The new size Ford, the Falcon. The Falcon, the new size Ford Falcon, you'll find that. The new size Ford Falcon's the easiest car in the wide world to own. Here's full comfort for six adults in a car that'll give you up to 30 miles a gallon. A new size car with a new size price. It's the easiest car in the world to own, the Ford Falcon. You can see these cars at your Ford dealer showroom now. 
the Falcon, the Thunderbird, and the 1964s. More machines on the production line made the work easier, but the motor industry was still a massive employer of manpower. With car factories, the end of a supply line that included thousands of workers across the country. Cuba is famous for retaining its pre-1959 American cars, which are kept running by any means possible. Since the Cuban Revolution, the influx of new cars was stalled by a US trade embargo. If the 1950s had been the decade of dazzle, the 1960s started out by turning down the brightness. The Cadillac 60 Special first appeared in 1938, and like many US model names, it stuck around a long time. Throughout the 1950s, the Cadillac 60 Special appeared as a stretched and optioned-up version of the Series 62. The 6.4-litre engine provided 325 horsepower. Air suspension using Freon-filled shock absorbers was optional on the 60 Special. The 1960 model saw new, shorter rear fins and a cleaner side trim design, as well as a rear grille design shared with Eldorado. Wheelbase remained 130 inches in a car 225 inches long, and the $6,223 price was the same as in 1959. Also new for 1960 was a vinyl roof covering as standard. Big changes were made for the 1960 Buicks, which lost the brand's trademark huge canted delta wing fins and slanted quad headlamps. A more subdued grille had concave vertical bars and quad headlights now sat side by side. Tail fins were integrated into the overall profile, their upper line extending to the windscreen. General Motors needed to counter Ford's Thunderbird and decided it should look like a Rolls-Royce with a hint of Ferrari. The result, the 1963 Buick Riviera. It was a styling milestone, a blend of curves and sharp lines. The Riviera's engineering was new from the ground up. Independent rear suspension and disc brakes were ruled out by maintenance and reliability issues, so special bushings gave the 1963 Riviera a smooth ride and finned aluminium brake drums were specified. Ford's revolutionary Mustang was initially based on the Falcon, Introduced in April 1964, the Mustang is Ford's most successful launch since the Model A. The prototype was a two-seater mid-engine roadster using a German V8 engine. For broader appeal, it became a four-seat car with front bucket seats and a rear bench. Cadillac had a great 1965, making 200,000 cars. The budget Series 62, a fixture since 1940, was renamed Calais. Eldorado and the 60 Special were officially Fleetwoods, like Series 75. A body change gave the 65s a longer, lower silhouette with flat fins, though a hint remained. A new straight black bumper and vertical lamps, the headlight pairs switched to vertical with a wider grille. Though Cadillac's V8 was unchanged, the slightly lighter 65s offered the luxury market's best power-to-weight ratio. A fully adjustable steering column and dual driving range turbo hydromatic transmission were fitted, and all models came with a new sonically balanced exhaust system. The 1965 potential of 800 cars per day was an all-time high, and the three millionth Cadillac was built. The Pontiac Le Mar was a compact and intermediate-sized model sold from 1962 to 1981. In 64, the Le Mans became available with a new performance package, designated as the GTO. The GTO option was priced at just under $300 more and included a larger V8 from the full-size Pontiac line that put up 325 or 335 horsepower, a four-speed floor shift manual transmission and heavy-duty suspension. In the late 60s, Pontiac's GTO was the definitive muscle car available as a two-door hardtop or convertible. Nothing rivaled the GTO's new energy-absorbing Endura bumper, which was molded and color-keyed to form the car's clean new nose, and hidden headlamps so popular that few realized there were actually options. 
The steering transmitted road shock and had little feel and some sheet metal wasn't the stoutest. But in the treacherous muscle car jungle, the new GTO remained one of the big cats. The Chevrolet Camaro was designed as a competitor for the Ford Mustang, sharing its platform and major parts with the Pontiac Firebird. Automotive media asked Chevrolet product managers, what is a Camaro? And were told it was a small, vicious animal that eats Mustangs. The Camaro debuted in September 1966 and was available as a two-door, two-plus-two coupe or convertible with a 250 cubic inch inline six-cylinder engine or V8s between 302 cubic inch and the 396 cubic inch engine used in the SS. A revamp of the original 1967 body created unique styling for just this season, carried on to the 1970 model when production problems delayed the redesigned next generation Camaro. The Super Sport, or SS, added about $300 to a Camaro and included stiffer suspension and bigger tires, power front disc brakes and a non-functional bonnet port. An extra $79 bought a new bonnet with its functional rear-facing inlet. Chevy would fit an L78 with aluminium heads. Of these, 311 went into Camaros. Chevy worked to improve the big block Camaro's rear suspension, but the 396 had so much weight over the nose that the rear axle struggled to get the power down. Savvy owners tackled the problem with traction kits, but less than 14,000 were really built. The 1970s proved to be a decade of tumultuous change for the automobile industry in the United States. Caught first in the economic turmoil of high interest rates, high inflation and price control, and then in the energy crises of 1973 and 79, the car industry bore the brunt of the changes brought upon the US economy. In addition to the domestic economic situation, US car makers also faced a changed international market with more competition from foreign manufacturers. The decade started badly with a paralyzing strike by the United Auto Workers Union during 1970. As a result, production at the four major manufacturers, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler and AMC, dropped by one million vehicles, 10% below 1969 figures. In addition to the strike, car makers were faced with a buying public that was increasingly focused on safety and fuel economy, two aspects which had not previously featured very highly in design criteria. Performance had been the prime focus of US car marketing, exemplified by muscle cars like the Mustang, Camaro and Firebird. But everything changed in the 1970s as the 73 oil crisis, exhaust emissions control rules, increasingly good and very affordable Japanese and European imports, and stagnant homegrown innovation dealt the American industry blow after blow. Ironically, full-size sedans staged a comeback in the years between the energy crises, with badges like Cadillac and Lincoln staging their best sales years ever in the late 1970s. Small performance cars from BMW, Toyota and Nissan took the place of America's big-engined cars. But the near-monopolistic conditions in the American car market bred complacency, and the assumption that the American lead in technology and marketing was unassailable. Previously, US firms had largely resisted innovation in the design and manufacture of cars, preferring to make money by increasing the size and weight of their vehicles by adding extras like air conditioning, power steering and fancy sound systems, compensating with bigger and bigger engines. It was European manufacturers who developed disc brakes, rack and pinion steering and diesel engines and took the lead in building safer, more efficient vehicles and the mass production techniques upon which the US industry so depended stifled innovation because it was so expensive to introduce fundamentally new models. On the back of two oil crises, imports of Japanese cars into the US soared in the 1980s to the dismay of the US companies and the workers' unions alike, taking nearly one quarter of the US market. And when the US car makers pressured the US government into limiting imports from Japan, Toyota and Nissan started building car plants in the US. By 2005, these Japanese transplants would be producing 4 million cars a year, one quarter of US output and more than GM. The US car companies tried and failed to design a competitive small car. 
If the 1980s was a decade of fear, the 1990s represented a false dawn. With oil back at $18 a barrel, US companies thought they had the answer to the Japanese threat, the sport utility vehicle. As light trucks, SUVs enjoyed a 25% import tariff and escaped government rules to boost fuel efficiency. SUV sales soared from 1 to 4 million, with 60% of the big three sales and nearly all their profits coming from SUVs. But as fuel prices rose, SUV sales slumped and demand for smaller vehicles rose again. But Detroit didn't have any to sell. The Cadillac CTS is a mid-sized luxury sports sedan and later a station wagon too. Launched in 2002 and credited with reinvigorating the Cadillac brand. It marked a return to rear-wheel drive cars and was the first Cadillac to be offered with a manual transmission since 1988. Sales were a sharp improvement over its predecessors and the CTS received the North American Car of the Year Award for 2002. Perhaps proving that poetry in motion wasn't a dead art in America, the Chevrolet SS concept car was revealed in 2003 but was never approved for official production. A four-door, four-seater sports sedan, the rear doors are almost invisible. The SS used an all-aluminium 6-litre V8 engine rated at 430 horsepower, which offers displacement on demand, a system which effectively shuts down a large portion of the engine when full power is not required. The system saves some fuel, but cuts emissions appreciably. The suspension attached to the aluminium chassis of the SS was tuned for performance rather than comfort and emphasized its sporting characteristics. The chassis features driver-adjustable shocks to change the damping ratio. The SS driver could tune the chassis for a softer setting during the week and dial in more performance for track use on weekends. Powerful wheel arches house 21-inch front and 22-inch rear aluminium wheels, and the SS also includes side gills, through fascia dual exhaust, and the brushed stainless steel panel surrounding the sporty round tail lamps. The design is a mix of styles and styling cues from both modern sports cars and muscle cars from the heyday of the US car industry. General Motors went broke in the global financial crisis in the first decade of the 21st century. The US government bailed out the company with $50 billion financing bankruptcy restructuring, mass layoffs, plant closures and billions of dollars in debt wiped out. But while the past is where we've come from, it is in the future that we will live. The Chevrolet Volt is a viable plug-in electric hybrid vehicle. For the first 40 miles, the Volt runs on lithium-ion batteries, but when the batteries run down, a small petrol engine recharges them, extending the Volt's range to more than 300 miles. Unlike most hybrid electric cars, the Volt is driven only by its electric motor. Although it's slightly older, the hydrogen drive-by-wire or high-wire fuel cell concept car is a long way from series production, although in 2003, GM said that it was confident it could produce a commercially viable model by 2010. The car runs on hydrogen fuel cells to create electricity and uses a drive-by-wire control system. The car's power system and single electric motor are built into a flat chassis like a skateboard, which lowers the car's center of gravity. With the drive and energy storage systems in the skateboard, the passenger compartment can be a four-door sedan, minivan or even interchangeable, all using the same drive system. The drive-by-wire system allows the controls to be operated from either of the front seats. The high wires fuel cell produces 94 kilowatts of power continuously and up to 129 kilowatts for short periods. It is supplied with hydrogen from three tanks in the chassis, and an electric motor gives the 1800 kilogram vehicle a top speed of 100 miles an hour. Hydrogen, the most common element in the universe, almost certainly holds the key to future energy needs. But the vehicles that use it will look nothing like the cars that have come from America over the last the century. The wonderful thing about the American road is the freedom it gives us. You've only to get in your car and start driving to feel it. The American Road.
what magnificent vistas open up before us as we travel along it. We have come a long way since the quadricycle and the Model T. These short years, our whole way of life has changed. We have accomplished much, but the achievements to come will dwarf our own. The American road stretches ahead of us, all towards a new horizon. We are all traveling along that road, all moving forward towards an even better tomorrow.